Now, we are in the fifth week of our, our Family 2.0 series. We're asking the question, how do we experience family life the way God intended the family to experience that family life? Last week, I talked to men, and I was very encouraging. You remember that? And I talked about how as men, there are five, sli- yeah, don't laugh at me. There are five slippery slopes that we hang out on, and we can sometimes play around the edge. And men, if we go down those slopes, when we, once we start, it's hard to stop. And often what happens is we take our families down with us because we give in to certain temptations, and our families, they're never, ever the same. So we talked about that. This, women, this week, I'm going to talk to women about how you ladies can be the person that God called you and created you to be. Uh, by the way, I was reminded of something this week. I got this, that there are a lot of differences between men and women. Here's one. Woman says, do you drink beer? Man, yes. Woman, how many, how many beers a, a day? Man, usually about three. Woman, how much do you pay per beer? Man, $5, which includes a tip, by the way. Woman, and how long have you been drinking? Man, about 20 years, I suppose. Woman, so a beer costs $5 and you have three beers a day, which puts your spending each month at $450. And one year, it would be approximately $5,400, correct? Correct. Woman, if in one year you spend $5,400, not accounting for inflation, the past 20 years puts your spending at $108,000, correct? Man, correct. Woman, did you know that if you didn't drink so much beer, that money could have been put into a step-up interest savings account and... After accounting for compounding interest for the past 20 years, you could have bought a new Ferrari. Man, do you drink beer? Woman, no. Man, where's your Ferrari? <laughs> see, ah, see, it's the way we think. You know. It's been over 20 years since Time Magazine ran this cover. And some of you men just went, you know, just the just uh, face of Hillary, right? A sin of a woman. She's, she, she's, she's a lightning rod for whether you love her or you hate her. That's not what I'm interested in. This is what it says. Hillary Rodham Clinton is the most powerful first lady in history. But here's this question. Does anybody have a problem with that? Forget that it's Hillary. Do any of us have problems with strong, competent women? It's interesting. Uh, it's sad to say, but even in 2015, the answer is a resounding Yes. In society and culture, we still struggle with strong, competent women. And I'll let you in on a secret. Being married to a strong, competent woman, I will tell you this, it's still true in church world. It's still true in Christian circles. We still have a hard time. We struggle with strong, competent women. So this weekend, I want to address the challenges that you ladies face when it comes to trying to live out God's calling on your life because you, you face some issues that as men, I'm going to be honest with you, we don't face. So you have an uphill battle. I want to talk about those challenges. You're going to see it has a direct impact on the family. To do this, I want to look at three stories in the book of Esther. Uh, if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and begin to turn over Esther chapter 1. I'll put the verses up on the screen if you didn't bring a Bible this weekend. But I want to look at three stories, and I'm going to point out some insights that maybe you can discuss at your small group this week, or maybe in the car ride home from church with your family. Worst case scenario, at least you'll be communicating as a family, right? So let's look at it. Esther, Esther chapter 1, we find a king. His name is Xerxes. He ruled the uh, Roman Empire. Understand at this time in history, the Persian Empire was so long that it's not an exaggeration, so, so long, so large. Listen, I was out at Holly Springs talking at 8 o'clock this morning, up at 4. You guys hadn't even gone to bed yet, so give me a little break here. The Persian Empire was so large, it's, it's safe to say that if you ruled the Persian Empire, you basically ruled the entire civilized world. So when you think of Xerxes, don't think of him as just king of Persia. Think of him probably as the most powerful man on the earth, on the planet at that time. And to celebrate his power, Xerxes decides that he's going to throw himself a party. Now this isn't any old party. This is the mother of all parties. This is a party. You can read the story yourself. This is a party that was designed to last 180 days. And over this 180-day time, he invited people from all across uh, the empire, rulers and political leaders and military leaders, and they're all showing up, and they're partying, and they're partying hard. They got their lampshades on. And, and to impress everybody with how powerful he was, Xerxes decided that he was going to put all of his stuff, all of his possessions on display. So he brings out all of his oil paintings and tapestries and jewelry and gold and silver and, and rubies and diamonds and his exotic car collection and his exotic animal collection, probably his baseball card collection. And he's got it all on display. 
And everybody's just going around. And they're very, very impressed. And I'm sure there was a lot of ooing and a lot of eyeing. And, and Xerxes, he's, he's feeling pretty good about himself. And I'm pretty sure the wine helped. But all of a sudden, he realizes, wow, what was I thinking? He's forgotten to display his most beautiful possession, most valuable possession. This is the possession that would make every man at the party drool. He has forgotten to display his beautiful trophy wife. Her name is Vashti. Let's pick up the story, Esther chapter 1, verse 10. On the seventh day when King Xerxes was in high spirits from the wine, see, I told you, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, and I, I, won't, I can't pronounce her name, so let's just skip to the next part, <laughs> to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown. Now, this is what's interesting. In the Hebrew, it's wearing only her royal crown. If you know what I'm saying, maybe throw on a pair of strappy stilettos, but other than that, just come, just come wearing your crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. So, the, the, you know, somebody goes and knocks on Vashti's door. Hey, Vashti, king says, put on your crown, nothing else. Come stretch your stuff in front of all the people. He goes back to the king. Where's Vashti? Vashti ain't coming. She ain't coming, right? And it says that when Xerxes receives this news, he goes ballistic. In fact, this is what it says in verse 12. Then the king became furious and he burned with anger. I mean, good gracious. All of his friends are hanging out. They're waiting for the, the queen uh, to strut her stuff. She refuses to show up. He's angry. He's embarrassed. He's the most powerful man on the planet. And his wife says no. He's got his reputation on the line. So he gets all of his advisors together. They go off in a corner trying to figure out how they're going to handle this very, very delicate situation. And these advisors are like, King, you've got to take this serious. We've got a potential nightmare on our hands. Look at verse 17. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women. Uh-oh. Uh, we know what happens when all the women find out. right? And they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes, you can see, we'll do it with the head bob, right? King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, even as we speak, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. King, this is a big deal. This could bite all of us on the butt. If we're not careful, this could turn into Persian wives gone wild. King, what are we going to do? we got to do something. So King Xerxes, he decides he's going to make an example out of Vashti. Verse 19, he issues a decree. Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes and let the king give her a royal position to someone else who is better than she. And that is the end of Queen Vashti. She's history. He kicks her to the curb. You never read about her again. But as I was reading and as I was getting ready for the message this weekend, I've got to tell you, the more I thought about Vashti's refusal, the more impressed I became for her, with her. Because, see, I realized that Vashti, she had to have been a woman of incredible character. This had to have been a woman of incredible substance. We don't know much about her spiritual background. We have no idea what kind of faith she had. Did she have any faith whatsoever? But this is what we know. We know that she refused to allow her husband, the most powerful man on the planet, to demean her by treating her as an object. She said, I'm not going to go there. I'm not playing that game. And as a result of her decision, she lost her role as the queen of Persia. Well, Esther was written about 400 B.C. That tells us that we know that for at least 2,500 years, I'm assuming it's longer than that, but for at least 2,500 years, men have been using and abusing women. But this is what's interesting. This is what I thought about. This is a topic that the church never talks about. This is a topic that churches never address. I mean, even, even the NFL is talking about domestic abuse. You're going to hear it all day as you listen to the Super Bowl leading up what the NFL has been. But the church typically, like always, lagging way behind and not addressing some of the issues that are right in front of us every day. I was also reminded of that because I got an email from one of the young ladies on our staff here at Hope. She writes this, while going through the family series, I have really enjoyed how you speak the truth frankly and without apology. It has made for interesting conversation in my single mom group. The one thing I would ask you to prayerfully consider while addressing the women is the fact that many of them are in relationships that are violent and frightening. Many of the women listening this weekend have evacuation plans in place in case their spouse becomes so violent they have to escape. And this is what she says. I lived with my suitcase packed, 
money and a spare set of keys tucked away in case my husband tried to prevent me from leaving and circumstances became too violent for me to stay. I have a friend who attends Hope, by the way, I met her last night, who was actually held captive in her home by her husband and had to find a chance to sneak out one of her children and tell her to run across a field to the nearest house, call the police, and never come back. I have another friend who was left for dead by her spouse after being physically assaulted by him. She was finally able to escape after, he, after she regained consciousness and he had left the home. And then she writes this, I believe in Christian relationships. I believe that is how God intended relationships to work, and it's my intention to follow that when and if God brings a man into my life. And I love sermons reminding women that they have a role intended for them to fulfill, to have a healthy marriage relationship that works as God intended. So I'm not asking you to change anything or tiptoe around the truth to not upset anyone. Truth is truth, no matter who's listening. Just asking that you would have these women in mind as you speak. So take this for what it's worth. I just felt that in my heart going into this weekend, I had to say something. And so I heard her. And I had the opportunity this week to sit down with Gail Wilkins. Gail is married to one of our elders here at Hope, but she works for the state of North Carolina. She is the executive director for the North Carolina Council for Women. A lot of what she does has to do with uh, abuse of women and, and human trafficking across the state of North Carolina. And we were able to sit down and talk about this issue. Watch the side screen. Well, Gail, I know you're a very, very busy woman. I, I do want to thank you for agreeing to allow me to interview you. And I guess the first question I want to ask you is, is abuse of women on the increase or is it something that's kind of leveled off? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer, um, primarily because domestic violence regarding women particularly is an underserved or underestimated number of um, crimes and situations simply because people refuse to report it. You know, and human trafficking is in the press a lot. Is this considered an aspect of abuse? People are forced and coerced into doing the most heinous things. In the state of North Carolina, unfortunately, most people are unaware that we're eighth in the nation. And being eighth in the nation, what we do is we have sex, sex trafficking as well as labor trafficking. And I may be wrong, but I think you share with me that right up the street from our Raleigh campus, there was human trafficking going on in one of our local motels right up the street. Well, yes, we have quite a bit of human trafficking all over. And when, when we talk about not only trafficking here, but uh, let me share with you some of the statistics, not only human trafficking, but particularly dating violence. Um, right here in Cary, um, we've been, in the last five years, we tracked some of your information, and 43 domestic violence homicides has taken place within Cary in the last five years. Wow, that doesn't make the news. No, it doesn't, because it's Cary. And then we have 122 overall in the state of homicide in the last five years. It's the second highest number, according to 2013, that we've had in five years. How does a woman recover? Well, actually, this is what we do at the Council for Women. We provide, through those agencies, we provide all types of counseling, uh, monetary um, help and assistance for their women as well as their children. We provide... Um, victim advocacy. Women do for, survive simply because we're very strong. Could you give us some insight into what we could do as a church to be more aware and be in a position to be part of the solution when it comes to the abuse of women? Well, you're already doing it. You're having me here. And so therefore, thousands and thousands of people will see that. Um, we have great programs in Wake County and Durham County. We have Interact. We have another program called the Durham Resource Center. You can train staff here so they can recognize domestic violence because it is happening here, contrary to anything. It's not, um, it's not a situation where one can identify someone being in domestic violence, um, human trafficking, sexual assault settings, because there's no a typical identifiable mark other than the physical abuse on the outward part. And so you're already doing it, and so we're just continue to ask you to support. In October is Domestic Violence Month, have some type of program. In January, actually, is Human Trafficking Month, so you're right on time. And then the month of March is Women History Month. So during those times, provide some type of training or just make mention of it. Now, you have thousands of ladies listening to you this weekend. They're probably going to see this on the Internet. What advice would you give them today if they are in an abusive situation? What should be their next step? Well, to be courageous, first of all. People don't understand, though, that immediately when a woman decides to leave her partner uh, because of a domestic violence situation, the number for the homicide rate increased tremendously. That's the typical time in which they will be um, 
killed or maimed in some form of way. And so they really need to be prepared. We have all types of um, safety plans that we help women with, preparing to get all of their data together for their children, finances. We do all of those things. And there are lots of programs out there that um, we can provide all types of systems for them to prepare. Gail, thank you so much, not just for being involved in Hope Community Church, but being involved in making a difference in our community. We love you. We appreciate you so much. Thank Thanks, you as sweetie. well. And I know that it's a sensitive subject. Yeah. But maybe this is what some of you ladies needed to hear this weekend. Maybe this is why God brought you here. I want you to know that we're going to be more proactive about this. Statistics say that one in four of you have been abused and you're experiencing some of the side effects. So I just encourage you as your pastor, but more importantly as your friend, uh, let us know. We have resources available. You can email us. You can call us. We want to help you get through this. It's okay to talk about, but take the steps you need to take in your life. Vashti said, I'm not going to put up with it. That's not what I signed on to when I agreed to be your wife. It cost her her queenship. The second story I want to talk about is about a guy named Haman. This guy's Xerxes' right-hand man. I guess we would consider him like the vice president. He was a very insecure man, but yet at the same time, I think he was full of himself to overcompensate for his insecurity. So much so that Haman, along with his entourage, his boys, his posse, they would kind of tour the city on a regular basis. It was an actual law that everybody had to acknowledge Haman when he walked by, by bowing down to him. A law had to be passed because of his insecurity. So everybody had to bow down to him. And everybody in the city bowed down to him except one guy. It was a Jewish dude. His name was Mordecai. Let's pick up the story, chapter 3, verse 2. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai, there's our guy, would not kneel down or pay him honor. And because of Haman's insecurity, I mean, this just drives him crazy. He's super bummed. So he goes home to his wife, slithers in under the door, and says, Honey, I don't know what to do anymore. I mean, I, <laughs> I went to the city again today, and everybody bowed down to me. He said, that old jerk, Mordecai, he just will not bow down to me. Now, meet his wife. Her name is Zeresh. I said that Vashti was a woman of, uh, of character. Varesh, uh, Zeresh, she would certainly be just a coward. And I say that because here she is. She has a strategic, a strategic opportunity as a wife to offer insight into her husband's life, his situation. She doesn't do that, and she kind of blows it. She could have said, honey... I don't know why you don't let this go. you got the respect of the king. You've got the respect of the staff. You've got the respect of me. You've got the respect of the kids. You've got the respect of the entire city. Isn't that enough? Why do you keep obsessing about this one guy? Just let it go. That's what she should have said. That's what any good wife should have said. She doesn't do that. Instead, she tells Haman what she knows he wants to hear. She's like, oh, Haman, you're so pitiful. You're such a victim here. You ought to be outraged. You ought to be so angry. What this guy's doing, it is so disrespectful. It is unbelievable. In fact, she suggests how Haman should handle the situation in chapter 5, verse 14. She says, have a pole set up, reaching to a height of 50 cubits. That's about 75 feet. And ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Well, that, that seems a little excessive, right? Now, notice this. Then go with the king to the banquet and have a great time. Enjoy yourself. And Haman's like, ooh, you were so sexy when you talk like that. Now I remember why I married you, right? But look how verse 14 concludes. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the pole set up. You're going to see in a minute, her advice backfires big time. But my question is this. Why would Zeresh pass up this key opportunity to give her husband some good, solid advice, speak some truth into his life? Why does she choose instead just to tell him what she thinks he wants to hear? Well, some would say it's, it's the result of thousands of years of condo, a condition, a cultural conditioning, and, and maybe that is true. But, but do you know what I think it, it comes from, especially in Christian circles? I think it comes from a misunderstanding of what the Bible means when it talks about the husband being head of the house, which it does say. I think it also comes from a misunderstanding uh, of the biblical concept of women submitting to their husbands, which it does say. Let me tell you what biblical submission doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that a woman is inferior to a man. It doesn't mean that a woman checks her brain at the altar when she gets married. It doesn't mean that a woman throws discernment out the window. It doesn't mean that a woman always has to agree with her husband. It doesn't mean that a wife should tell her husband what he wants to hear. It doesn't mean that a, a woman should stay in an abusive situation. The Bible doesn't ask you to do any of those things. Paul talks about this whole topic of submission 
in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. And see, sometimes we jump to the part about wives submitting and husbands loving, but we, we, we skip this key part. This is what he says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Submit to who? Submit to who? Yeah, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And right away, Paul tells us that there is this biblical expectation that as Christians, we're supposed to submit to one another. Well, what does that mean? Well, the word submit means this. It means to place yourself under someone's authority. In other words, I'm to submit myself to your authority. You're to submit yourself to my authority. In fact, what it really means is this. I'm going to consider your deal more important than my deal. And it's not just on Mother's Day or Father's Day or a birthday or a special day or an anniversary. I'm going to consider your deal more important than my deal as a lifestyle. You're going to consider my deal more important than your deal as a lifestyle. There's mutual submission going on here. And then Paul gives us some examples of what this looks like. He starts with wives, and he says in verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. There it is right there. As you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And that shouldn't surprise us. Because Paul just told us in verse 21 that we all should be submitting to one another. So he says, wives, you should consider your husband's deal more important than your deal. When you're in your home, you're to put your husband ahead of yourself. <laughs> and all the men are going like, that is awesome. But what about us? Because it's mutual submission. Look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In other words, husband, you're supposed to do pretty much the same thing your wife does. You're to focus all of your resources. You're to focus all of your abilities on your wife's needs, on her desires. In other words, you're to do for your wife, get this now, guys. You're to do for your wife exactly what Christ did for the church. Well, what did Christ do for the church? He took all the power that he could have used on himself. He took all the resources of heaven that he could have used on himself and he focused it on what was in the best interest of the church. Even to the point he died, he gave his life up for the church. You see, in a biblical marriage, it's not about, hey, woman, get my slippers and while you're at it, bring me a beer. It's not about that at all. It's about a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, mutually submitting to one another. And in the security of that knowledge, in the security of that position, if a wife needs to warn her husband about something, if she needs to put something in perspective, she does it without feeling guilty. She speaks the truth in love to her husband. Now, as we're going to see, unfortunately for Haman, Zeresh didn't understand this principle. But I'll tell you who does. My wife, Laura. She understands this principle. I'll never forget, you know, I used to be a very strict verse-by-verse, word-by-word Bible teacher. It would take us three to four years to get through the book of Romans, maybe another two years to get through the gospel of John. And I used to just dig in. And, and what I realized after about 15 years was I was turning out a lot of, of seminary-trained people. And they really, really knew the Bible, but there was no life change. And we weren't impacting and changing our community. And, and, and God just began to lay on my heart what changes people's lives is not just to know the truth. In fact, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, knowledge puffs up. But how do you know it in such a way that you can apply it and begin to live it out? And so I began to try to make this transition to more of an application style of teaching. Well, just like anything else, I went from this way over here. I mean, the pendulum swung way over here where I was using very little Bible and I was very entertaining and people liked it. But, you know, uh, I went home one Sunday after church and I said, hey, honey, what would you think of the message today? And I'm all ready for her to tell me just how wonderful I am. And she said, honestly, and that's never good. Anytime your wife says, honest, you want to be honest? She said, it was horrible. And she said, you're, you're entertaining, but honey, you got to remember, you're, you're a good Bible teacher. It's the word of God that changes lives, not you entertaining people. See, that's a wife saying, let me tell you not what you want to hear, let me tell you what's in your best interest. Maybe nobody else will tell you this, I'll tell you this. That's a good wife. There was one time I was, I was sitting down on the hearth, I had my head in my hands, and she came and sat down beside me. She said, babe, what's wrong? And I said, I, I said honey, you know, I, was, I said, this, just the stress right now. I just feel like I am going to, ab I said, there's this feeling I'm going to just explode. I don't even know what to do with it. And she said, well, she said, I know you're going through a stressful time. And I pray for you every day. But you know what, honey? God put you to be the spiritual leader of this church. Quit having a pity party. And get up and do what you tell everybody else to do. Trust God when you're going through the storm. Eventually, he'll bring you out the other side. 
So I got up out of the fetal position, quit sucking my thumb, and got dressed, and here I am. I came to talk to you guys this morning, see? <laughs> you have to go. You're the pastor. You have to go, right? <laughs> now, I'm going to let you in on a secret. Only insecure men want to be married to a anything-you-say-dear kind of woman. Healthy, mature Christian men want to be in a relationship with a respect-worthy, competent, spiritual woman. Do you know why? Because we understand intimacy flows out of mutual love. Intimacy flows out of mutual respect. Intimacy flows out of mutual accountability. Intimacy flows out of mutual submission. And I'm just going to tell you, ladies, that's what most of us are looking for. So find that balance. How do you speak the truth in love into your husband's heart? There's one last story from the book of Esther. It's about Esther herself. Xerxes, he doesn't like the playboy, single king lifestyle. So he decides he wants a wife. And to find a wife, he decides that he is going to hold a Miss Persia contest. He's going to hold a, a, a beauty contest. And whoever wins is going to be his new wife. By the way, Xerxes probably could have used some sensitivity training. I'm not sure they had it back in 400 B.C., but he could have used some. Well, Esther, who is Jewish, decides to enter the contest. Not only does she enter the contest, you got to read the book of Esther. It's an incredible story. She wins the contest. She becomes the new queen of Persia. While Esther is now the queen of Persia, Haman, remember, mean old Haman that's married to Zeresh, he decides he wants to get rid of all the Jews. By the way, we often think of World War II. This has been going on since the history of mankind. People trying to get rid of the Jews because they are God's chosen people. But God's going to protect his chosen people. But Haman decides to take on the Jews. He's going to eradicate all the Jews. So Mordecai, remember Mordecai, the Jewish guy who would not bow down to Haman? Guess what? He's Esther's uncle. See, it's all starting to come together now. And he hears on the street there's this plot to eradicate all the Jews. And so he says, I have got to get word of this to Esther. So he sends the message. Basically, the message says this. Esther, now that you're queen, I want to encourage you. I want to beg you. Use your influence with the king to prevent this potential disaster. Look at what it says, Esther chapter 4, verse 14. Uh, Mordecai is speaking. He says, for Esther, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. In other words, he understood the Messiah eventually has to come through the Jewish race. God's going to protect his people somehow. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position. Here's that key phrase, for such a time is this. Esther, who knows? Maybe God allowed you to win that contest and become the new queen of Persia for this very reason, for such a time as this. You've got to intervene. Now, understand this is a very risky request because queens in those days, they were to be queenly, they were to be beautiful, they were to be quiet. In fact, there was a law that the queen could not even approach the king and have a conversation with him unless the king first initiated it and invited her to speak. Esther knew that this was the law. So when Mordecai, her uncle, says, you've got to do this, the whole race may be depending on you, you've got to do this, she already knows, best case scenario, I might only get dequeened. Worst case scenario, this could cost me my life. Esther knows that. But here's Uncle Mordecai thinking, this may be our only hope. I've got to get word to Esther. Maybe she'll intervene. Maybe she'll make a difference. And I want you to see Esther's response, chapter 4, verse 16. She says, go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. I've prayed about it. This is what God wants me to do. So I'm going to do the right thing, even if it costs me my life. Now think about it. Vashti had character. Zeresh was a coward. But I'm telling you, few women in history have had the courage that Esther had. She committed herself at the risk of her life to fulfill a divine mission. And she didn't do it to impress or please Mordecai. She did it to please and honor God. And when you read the story, you find out that God honored her for her choices and the courage that she manifested, and God intervened, and, and the disaster was averted. She saves her people. And what's interesting is in a, a twist of fate, Haman ends up being impelled on the very pole that he set up for Mordecai. You can read about it in Esther chapter 6. But the point I want to underscore is that Esther's heroic actions weren't motivated by her desire to please another person. They were motivated by her desire to please God. Now, ladies, if you haven't discovered this yet, all through your life, you're going to encounter people who have an agenda for you. 
I just want you to understand, when that happens, you are under no biblical obligation to fulfill that agenda just because somebody else wants you to. I would encourage you, be like Esther. When that request comes your way, get on your knees and begin to say, God, are you in this? And you just keep that request before God until God gives you that confidence. I think God is up to something. I think he has a specific mission for me. I don't think it's an accident that I am in the position that I am in. And I'm telling you, as you seek God, sometimes you're going to find God saying, that's not for me. But sometimes you're going to find God saying, yes, I am up to something. In fact, I have an exciting redemptive plan and you are a part of it. I have made you who you are. I made you just the way you are. I gave you your gifts. I gave you your talents. I gave you your abilities. And now I have put you in the position that you're in for such a time as this. So ladies, let me just ask you a question this weekend. Where are you in this story? Because you're in here somewhere. Let me give you a little bit of application. First of all, God has called some of you to the role of being a mom at this stage in your life. God has called you to a role of motherhood. And if that's the case... You ignore culture. You ignore society. You, you ignore those women's right groups that think you, you just are, you're, you're not living up to what you could be by being a mother. You ignore what Cosmo has to say, right? You hold your head up high and fulfill that calling with every fiber of your being. And you tune out every voice that downplays the importance of your calling to the role of a mom. I mean, if that is the mission that God has for your life, do it with courage and do it with grace. And don't shrink back regardless of what anybody says. So some of you, you've been called to a season of motherhood. Second, God has called some of you to a mission that doesn't include being a mom at this stage in your life. And if that's the case, set your hand to the task that God has called you to accomplish and you hold your head up high and you don't apologize to anybody. God has put you right where you are for such a time as this. And then God has called some of you to be a mom but he's also called you to a mission outside the home at this stage in your life. And if that's the case, you do it with all your heart. And maybe you need to go back every year and just read Esther and remember Esther because she is a wonderful picture of a woman who carried out a divine mission simply because it's what God wanted her to do. You see, ladies, when it's all said and done, here's the question. How do you want to be remembered? I mean, how do you want to go to your grave? Do you want to look back and realize that all you did with your life was basically carry out somebody else's agenda? Or do you want to look back at your life and say, God, I followed your guidance in my life as you gave me a mission. And I accomplished that mission with the kind of passion and the same kind of intensity as Esther did. I think that's what you want. So this weekend, I, I encourage you, summons the character of Vashti and the courage of Esther. And maybe mark this date as a defining day in your life and see where the Holy Spirit is taking you. What is this calling on your life? I told you when I began this series, some of the tension in mine and Laura's relationship is because Laura has just as strong a calling on her life as I have on my life. But I believe that one of the reasons we've made it for 36 years and God has blessed our marriage is because there's a mutual respect for the calling that he's placed on each other's lives and how can we support each other. Now, i got to let you go, but there's one more thing. I, this is for men and women. I could not teach the book of Esther. I would, be, I would not be a diligent pastor if I didn't just share this principle with you. And this is for everybody, men and women across the board. It's this. We will never take the risk to do great things for God until we believe, like Esther, that one person can make a difference. Until we believe that one person can make a difference. And it sounds so great to say that, but you know what it requires? It requires us to stop worrying about what other people are thinking. And let's face it, that's not always easy. I love harmony. I like to be surrounded by harmony. I don't like unrest. But I'm going to tell you something. I get second-guessed at least 100 times a day <laughs> about my message, about the direction of the church, about the vision, about what we're doing in the community, what we're doing in the world. Do you know what helps me? It helps me remember that I don't answer to, the other, to other people. It helps me to remember that at the end of the day, I answer to God. And I have figured this out. God has shown himself faithful. He will give you the wisdom and the courage when he wants you to step up and something needs to be done. Over the last 24 months, I have had to make some of the hardest decisions I have ever had to make in my life. 
I'm talking about the kind of decisions that when you crawl in bed at night and close your eyes, you know that this one is all on you. A lonely place to be. And you may be in the same kind of situation. You may be in a situation where no one will stand up and you're the only one who feels the way you feel. But let me tell you, you are one. You are one. But you'll never make the right choice, the hard choice like Esther. Unless you believe that one person can actually make a difference. So men, ladies, refuse to settle for anything less than fulfilling God's calling on your life. Maybe right now he's calling you to do something specific for such a time as this. And you know what? If you perish, you perish. But I'm telling you, if you perish for what God has called you to do, wow. I don't think that's a bad way to go, do you? Let's pray. Father, right now I, I, lift, I, lift, I lift these women up to you. I lift the ones who have been in abusive situations. You know who they are. You know where their heart is. You know the confusion. You know the tension of the making one decision or, or leaving a relationship and staying in a relationship. Father, you know all of these things. Give them the courage and your spirit to make the right choice. And let them know that they're under no obligation out of being submissive to stay in a relationship where their life and the lives maybe of their children are in danger and could be damaged. Give them courage. I pray for single moms right now who have to get up in the morning and get the kids off to school, then go to work all day, then come home and fix dinner, then get the kids' homework done, and then get them a bath, and then get them to bed, and get up every day and start it over again and again and again, all by themselves. Give them strength they don't even know they have. As they realize they can't just be the mom, they also have to try to somehow fill the role that the dad has vacated. Give them wisdom as to how to do that. I pray for stay-at-home moms who seem to get made fun of in our culture so often. Reward them for the high calling that you've called them to. Pour out your grace on their life. May they hold their head up high with dignity as they realize they're investing in the next generation that is going to lead us and be a light in this dark world. And Father, we... Pray for those women who have to play both roles, mom and in the marketplace, and just the energy that is needed there. And we, we pray for those who you've called into the marketplace or into politics for such a time as this. Help them to understand one person can make a difference if their motive and their attitude is to lift you up, Father. Incredible things can happen. So we thank you for this time we had together today, and we thank you for the life of Esther. And may we, these truths, maybe these reverberate in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen.